Okay, welcome everybody. Um, those of you online and in person, it's fantastic to, to see everyone here. Um, it's great as well to see a mix of friends, family, colleagues, etc., and especially people from over the course of Tom's uh, career and, and life prior to being here today. Um, just a, cu a couple of uh, points for housekeeping at the moment before we kick off. Uh, we are having a few technical glitches with the chat on the team, so if that's not working for you um, and you want to ask some questions of the talk later, please do it on the, via the streaming uh, setup on the YouTube account for Imperial College. Okay. Um, also, please note as well that the lecture will be recorded as well as the questions at the end. Um, another quick point, um, for those of the, you in the building, uh, if there is a fire alarm, please follow the exit, the emergency exit signs, and the assembly point is on the corner of Imperial College Road and Exhibition Road. Okay, so uh, that's it really for the, the main bits of housekeeping. Um, I'll give a brief recap of Tom's career to date, and then um, we'll get on with the main business of the evening, which is going to be Tom's talk, of course. So prior to arriving on these shores here in the UK in 2002, 20 years ago, Tom um, did his undergraduate and postgraduate studies in Canada, first at McGill and then UBC, and then in 2002 he arrived um, at Oxford to do his DPhil, and he stayed there for some time after the, the uh, PhD was completed. He got his doctorate and carried on there as a, a lecturer in the department. And in 2010, he was awarded a Royal Society Fellowship, so a very prestigious award, uh, which he continued for briefly at Oxford and then took that with him when he joined us here at Imperial uh, in 2011. Uh, Tom arrived there a couple of years uh, before I did, so we're kind of in the same cohort in that sense. Um, so really, since Tom arrived at Imperial, he's had an enormous impact on what we do and particularly not just his own work, but much of the collaborative work that he's done in the department and in the wider sphere of, of college. Tom has published some enormously influential papers. He's been extremely successful uh, with grant funding. And just as an example, uh, he, had, he was awarded uh, a European Research Council uh, large grant um, and then followed up by a Natural Environment Research Council series of grants. Many of these have been uh, very large in size and very collaborative. And Throughout that time, Tom has fostered and built links with many people within and outside Imperial College. He's the co-director of the Microbiome uh, Network, and more recently, uh, he's been taking on a, a senior management role at Imperial. He's the academic lead at the Silwood Park campus, where he works very closely with me, and has been an, an amazing um, help through the, through the last few years in that role. Uh, and perhaps most excitingly of all, um, on the near horizon, as of this autumn, he'll be taking over the new Holobiont Centre, which is a Leverhulme Centre, which is funded to the tune of £10 million uh, for the next decade, so a million pounds a year, roughly, um, that will be kicking off um, in the autumn. So I'll just finish off now with um, a, a quick point for the, the, the questions. There'll be a mix of questions that will be coming from the live uh, session, and then also we'll try and alternate with those that have put them into the chat line, or if that's not operating through the YouTube channel, and Theo and Tom will be handling those. So if you've got questions, please um, keep them, uh, put them into the chat line or via the YouTube channel, or if you're here in person, we'll uh, triage with, with the microphones. Uh, there'll be a vote of thanks that'll be given by Professor Tim Barraclough at the end, and then we'll also convene for drinks afterwards. Okay. So I'd like to hand over now to Tom, and we're going to hear now all about the little engines that basically drive our world. Okay? Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, so thank you all for coming today. Um, and I realize many of you have given up your evening to, to be here today. Some of you have, have traveled quite a long way. Uh, to listen to me talk about bacteria. And I, I realize that many of you have very little interest in bacteria, actually. Um, perhaps uh, you're aware of them as causing diseases. Maybe they've made you ill in the past. Uh, maybe you've left the food in the refrigerator for a bit too long, uh, and it's turned into something like this. Uh, but some of you have a little bit more interest in them. You might have enough interest to know that 
this probably isn't a bacterium, it's probably a fungus. Uh, maybe you're studying for your GCSEs uh, and you're trying to learn the parts of the bacterial cell, furiously trying to remember whether bacteria have membrane-bound organelles or not. Um, uh, uh, something I could never really remember at the time. And perhaps you have a vague recollection of sort of dusty old textbooks, uh, the tree of life with bacteria somewhere near the base, uh, some you know, undescribed sorts of microbes sit sitting around with more advanced organisms such as ourselves in the crown of this tree of life. Um, so what I'll be trying to do today is to, for the first part at least, just convince you a little bit about why you should care about bacteria, why you should be interested in bacteria, and in fact why they are some of the most important organisms on this planet. Uh, so who cares about bacteria? I'll try to go through three different reasons why you should care about bacteria. And the first reason is that they're incredibly abundant. They're some of the most abundant creatures on Earth. And it's, it's actually very difficult to conceive just how abundant bacteria are. And so what I'll try to do to illustrate this is to take you through the usual thought experiment of making piles of things. So we'll make a pile of bacteria. And we'll think about how high that stack of bacteria would reach if we piled all the bacteria in the world, one on top of the other. And I want you to just think a little bit about how high you think that stack would be, whether it would be as tall as a building or from here to the moon or whatever it is. So think of that and then sort of double it or triple it or something like that, and I still guarantee that you'll be nowhere near how high this pile of bacteria is going to go. Uh, so I'll give you the data you need to perform this calculation. A, a typical bacterial cell is about a micron, uh, which is one one thousandth of a millimeter, very, very small. Uh, we could write this in scientific notation, 10 to the minus three millimeters, so that's, you need to move that decimal place over three times to get to one. Um, or we can translate that into meters, so it's 10 to the minus six meters, a zero point five zeros and then a one. So very small creatures, so small of course we can't see them. But they're also incredibly abundant. So if you take a teaspoon of pond water, one milliliter of pond water, you have about 10 to the six bacteria in that milliliter. So a one followed by six zeros. Um, a gram of soil contains usually, typically, a lot more, more like 10 to the nine bacteria. Uh, a gram of feces, that's poo for the children in the audience, uh, will contains about 10 to the 11 bacteria, quite a lot. And using the average size of a bacterium, we can stack them on top of each other and get how much what height of bacteria we reach with each of these different environmental samples. So a milliliter of pond water contains about a meter of bacteria. A gram of soil contains about a kilometer of bacteria, and a gram of feces contains about 10 to the 5 meters. And you can see that this adds up very, very rapidly. Um, if we think of the distance from the Earth to the Sun, uh, to the Moon, rather, it's about 400,000 kilometers. Uh, which is equivalent to about 400 kilograms of soil or the amount of bacteria in four, in four kilograms of, of feces, which is rather a lot of feces, but it's about the average deposit of an elephant, I found out. So one elephant deposit equals the stack of bacteria from here to the moon. Um, so how high of a stack would a stack of bacteria, if we counted up all the bacteria on Earth? Well, of course, we could never do that, but we do have some estimates. Um, the, they vary f f fairly considerably in terms of what their magnitude is, but one of the me most reputable is around that there are around 10 to the 30 bacteria on the planet. There are lots of assumptions that go into this measurement. It depends a lot on how many bacteria there are in deep sea sediments and things like that. But it's on that order of magnitude or thereabouts. If we take that, our measurement of one micron per bacterium, that's about 10 to the 24 meters or 10 to the 21 kilometers of bacteria. That is a huge distance. If we look at the distance from the sun to the nearest star, it's about 10 to the 15 kilometers. And if we look at the distance from the Earth to the next galaxy over, it's about 10 to the 19 kilometers. So we could make a stack of bacteria that goes from here 
to the Andromeda galaxy 100 times over. That's a lot of bacteria. There are bacteria are so abundant, they're more abundant than you can imagine. Second point is that they're also incredibly diverse. So if we look at this old picture of uh, what the tree of life looks like, it's incredibly skewed towards the sorts of creature that we're familiar with, towards things like animals and plants. Um, we can actually build more realistic trees nowadays because we don't need to rely on what the, anim what the organisms look like. We can actually look at their DNA sequences and use the DNA sequences to build new trees of life. And this is what the new tree of life looks like, uh, entirely based on DNA sequences. Um, looks quite different from the tree that I put up before, but I can orient you. And if you're interested in where the bacteria are, it's this crown of the tree of life up here. Uh, the rest of the tree includes the archaea, which are organisms you may or may not have heard of, which are things that are, for all intents and purposes, are a lot like bacteria. They're unicellular, microbial. They don't have membrane-bound organelles. Uh, they were classified alongside bacteria until relatively recently. And if you're looking for you and me, then we're down here along one branch, all of the animals and fungi along one of these branches, and all of the plants along another branch. Uh, the rest of this group are all microbial eukaryotes. So there are things that are uh, uh, you know, smaller than we can see, but which makes up most of the diversity of this branch. So there is much more biodiversity in the bacteria than there is in all the rest of the tree of life combined. Uh, and the final point that I'll make is that bacteria are incredibly important. And I'm, I'm interested in this from an, ecological, from, from an ecological perspective. And when we're thinking about ecology, we're thinking about ecosystems and cycles of nutrients and matter and energy within ecosystems. Um, and you can look at any of these cycles, and bacteria will play important, pivotal roles within any cycle you care to look at. So this is an illustration of the carbon cycle, for example. Uh, very broadly speaking, uh, carbon is taken up from the atmosphere by plants. Plants use the energy from the sun to build molecules, to build uh, the parts of the plant, to build seeds. Um, and then, uh, so those are called autotrophs, and then heterotrophs break that down. So we eat the plants, and we break down those molecules and get the energy from the molecules, and we respire the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So CO2 comes in to build the molecules, and then it is respired out again to, uh, when they're broken down. And you can see in this carbon cycle, there's nothing that says bacteria in there, but they're hidden. So they're hidden in places like here it says soils. Well, the, the carbon dioxide coming out of the soil is for largely carbon dioxide, which is being respired by bacteria in the soil. Um, and even familiar things like the cows, like sure, the cows bring the grass into the mouth and into their stomach, but in the stomach, it's the bacteria that are breaking down that grass. So all the, and archaea, so all that methane that's being released at the other end of the cow is actually produced by bacteria and archaea. And it's the same with any of these biogeochemical cycles. This is an illustration of the nitrogen cycle, a similar sort of idea though here. So here we have a lovely rabbit and some plants, which certainly play important roles. Uh, but there are parts of this biogeochemical cycle which are conducted by bacteria and bacteria only. They're irreplaceable. Um, I think it's safe to say that we could get rid of all the plants and all the animals on the planet, and there would be a period of adjustment, but life would go on more or less as it is now, whereas if you got rid of the bacteria, uh, the, uh, life would not be able to survive. Uh, so bacteria underlie the most important ecosystem processes. Um, so bacteria, they're the most abundant organisms on Earth. They're the most biodiverse organisms on Earth. And they're the most important organisms on Earth. So you should be interested in them. Um, and if you're a scientist in this room, then you should be studying them as well. Uh, and so that's why I study them. That's where my interest comes from. Uh, and I'm interested in them. I'm interested in the ecology of these organisms. Um, because very little, very, until very recently, very little has known about the ecology of, of bacteria. So what I've been doing over the past uh, many years is to try to understand 
which bacteria live where. If we go out into a forest, then what sorts of bacteria do we find in the soil versus in the pond? Um, why do they live where they do? Is it because of the environmental, because the, the pond and the soil differ in some fundamental way that selects for particular species but not for others, for example? And finally, what impact do they have on these kinds of ecosystem processes? Um, and these are, these are difficult questions to answer. And one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why they're such difficult questions to answer is because these communities are so complex. So when we go into that forest and we take a little bit of soil and we try to study it, the number of bacterial cells within that little scoop of, of, of soil is there are many cells there as there are humans on the planet. And when we look at how much diversity there is there, there's as much diversity as there is in a tropical forest. And so trying to you know, figure out why you get certain bacteria in certain places is quite a difficult enterprise. Uh, so what I've tried to do through my career is to try to simplify, to try to reduce that complexity into manageable systems that we can start to understand that uh, and yet mimic the natural systems from which they were derived. Um, and so the ideal system to study would be one that's, that's tractable, that's uh, accessible, so we could go out and find, find it in different locations, that's reproducible, so we could take that ecosystem and recreate it in the lab where we could study it, and so forth. Uh, and this is the ecosystem that I first came up with. Um, I wasn't the first to study it, but uh, one of the first to study it from the perspective of the microbes that are living in there. So this picture here is a large beech tree. Uh, beech trees are, uh, are cosmopolitan, have cosmopolitan distribution. They're found uh, throughout most of the UK and Europe and so forth. Um, so they're found everywhere pretty much. Uh, and they have a couple of really uh, fairly unique features in our forest. The first is that even as this big tree, it has quite smooth bark. And the second is that uh, it's quite a shallow rooting uh, uh, tree. And therefore, uh, to stop it from falling over, it has this buttressing at the base of the tree. And this combination of features means that when it rains, as it often does in this country, the rain comes down the bark of the tree and accumulates in the buttressing to make a little pond. And I study these little ponds, these little puddles of rainwater which are formed and where you have diverse communities, uh, mostly microbes, but also other kinds of organisms, which are accessible. We can go into a forest and we can find lots of these little puddles. They're fairly permanent, so most of them are around for years on end, uh, and they're reproducible. We can bring them back to the lab and reproduce a similar system in the lab so that we can study it in more detail. Um, and also, importantly, they have uh, a fairly simple set of ecosystem processes that we can study. There is not much primary production within the tree holes, within these puddles. Uh, if there was a lot of sunlight coming onto the puddles, then the puddles evaporate and you don't see them. So most of the activity in there is heterotrophic. It's organic matter being broken down, and it's one kind of organic matter. It's just beech leaves which are falling into these holes and being broken down by a variety of bacteria and fungi and aquatic insects. Um, and so I've been working for a long time now trying to understand the ecology of these little puddles. Um, and the sort of thing that we do is we go into the wilds of the UK, um, find a woodland, find some puddles of water, and we take a little bit of the water and we plate it out on an agar plate. So agar is just this jelly-like substance, uh, you spread the water on top of it, and if there are any bacterial cells in there, then the bacterial cells divide and divide and divide until they've divided so many times that you can see a colony of bacteria. And each of those colonies, because they were derived from a single cell, you know that that's one type of bacterium. You can use a sterile toothpick to isolate that bacterium and pick it into an individual well of this multi-well plate, and then you've captured it. And you can identify it by sequencing its genome or sequencing part of its genome. Um, and 
very importantly and very usefully, for, you can actually put them in the freezer and store them in the freezer forever and take them out when you want to do experiments. And that means we can do experiments over and over again with different combinations of bacteria that we've isolated from the field environment. So in the lab, what we've been doing is we've been going into this library of bacteria and creating different kinds of community in microcosms and measuring processes like rates of leaf litter degradation. These are very laborious experiments. And uh, I spent a long time during my PhD doing this all by hand, putting together different mixtures of bacteria. Uh, we've automated that to some degree at the moment, so we have liquid handling robots that can actually put together the mixtures of bacteria. So this is a, a robot with eight pipetting heads. Uh, it's got a little uh, pipetting tip on the, the end of each one, and it's going into these deep well plates, these white plates here. In each of the wells of this plate, you have a single kind of bacteria and it's picking out the ones that we want in order to construct a known community. And we've done that for lots and lots of experiments, and I'll try to summarize some of them, uh, sort of breeze through a little bit of the results now, some of these more complicated than others. But this is one of the first results that I obtained. This is my PhD in one slide. Um, I worked for, um, uh, yeah, for those of you in here who are doing their PhDs, it's a little bit disheartening to know that you can summarize three years of work in one figure, but here you have it. Um, so uh, this is a summary of what happens when you change what's in a community, uh, what happens to uh, some, some of these ecosystem processes. So on the y-axis, the response variable is the total amount of respiration we're getting from that community. It's the amount of carbon dioxide that's being, um, uh, that's being respired by the community as a whole, and it, we use it as a proxy measure of decomposition rates. It's how quickly the leaf litter within those microcosms is getting broken down by the bacteria that are in the microcosm. And on the x-axis, uh, uh, we have the species richness, the number of species that are found within those microcosms. So on the left-hand side, we have microcosms that just have a single species, and then we have microcosms that have two species, and so on. Um, each of the lines here is one mixture. So uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of different mixtures. You can see that you have a lot of variation so it's not the case that when you have one species, you just have one outcome. You have some species that are very good at breaking down the leaf litter and some that are relatively poor. But what is definitely the case is that as you put more and more species into the mixture, you get more and more of the leaf litter that gets broken down. Uh, the black dots here are the average at each level, the mean at each level of species richness, and you can see that there's a very predictable outcome. Um, as you increase the number of species, you get, on average, more and more respiration that's coming off of them. Uh, so that's the pattern. You'll notice a few other things that this isn't, a this isn't an arithmetic scale on the x-axis. It's called a logarithmic scale, which means that the numbers get further and further apart as you go along this axis. So we get a little bit of increase in respiration when we go from one to two species but we need to add a lot more species to get the same amount of increase, to, to get the same amount of increase as we increase the amount of diversity in these communities. Uh, so progressively, as you add diversity, you get less and less respiration. So that's a nice pattern. It's an interesting empirical pattern. You change the species richness and you get an outcome. And a lot of what I've been doing since then, is trying to explain this pattern. Why do we get the pattern that we see in this case? And uh, the reason why this happens, the reason why it happens in this way, is because of the way in which the bacteria are interacting within that microcosm. Um, as the bacteria, as you increase the level of complexity, each single species is respiring less and less. When species are together, they're behaving in different ways they're, uh, 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 via their interactions with other species. Um, so we've been studying these interactions in some detail, sort of getting away from the impacts necessarily on those ecosystem processes and just looking specifically at 
the kinds of interactions that are happening amongst these species of bacteria. And there are lots of different possible interactions, so they, they could, of course, ignore each other. Um, uh, we would know that they're ignoring each other by growing one of the species on its own, growing the other species on its own, and then putting them together and seeing what happens. And if they, they grow, if when they're together, they grow in exactly the same way as when they're apart, then we know that they're ignoring each other. But typically what will happen is that they will, they will not ignore each other. One thing that they can do is they can fight together. And they fight in a, a few different ways. One is by releasing toxins into the environment, uh, by releasing antibiotics, for example, that, that kill the other species or inhibit their growth. Or they can influence each other indirectly. Perhaps they're feeding on the same food source. And the food that's used up by one of the species is then not available to the other species. And in this way, the other species' growth is diminished. Uh, or they could be helping each other. There are lots of interesting ways in which they can do that. Uh, they may be uh, releasing uh, metabolic byproducts into the, uh, in, into, the, uh, uh, into the growth medium, which can then be used by the other species. Um, so it could be used as a food source and in that way help it to grow. Uh, or it could be some combination of these things. So we can categorize those interactions in this kind of way. Um, so we have here on this, uh, in, in the rows, the impact of the yellow species on the green, and in the columns, the impact of the green species on the, on the yellow. And we have three different possibilities, fight, ignore, or help. And if they're both fighting together, then we call that an antagonism. If they're both helping each other, then we're calling that a mutualism. If one helps and the other fights, then that would be some form of exploitation. And of course, we have all the combinations that also have names for them, but I haven't filled in the table. And so one of the things that we've been doing a lot of is trying to understand how these interactions come about, how they evolve, how they change over time, and what they look like in these tree hole environments. Uh, and so we've done experiments where we've actually looked at how uh, looked at the impacts of different species combinations. So here we have on the x-axis the impact of one bacterial species on another. Um, zero means that they're ignoring each other. Increasingly negative means that species A has an, is increasingly slowing, inhibiting species B, whereas a positive number means that it's helping species B. And on the y-axis we have the the reverse, so the impact of species B on species A. And you can see, and we can divide this into four quadrants. In this quadrant, you have antagonisms, negative, negative interactions. In this quadrant, you have mutualisms, positive, positive interactions. And here we have positive, negative, and negative, positive interactions, different kinds of exploitation. And you can see most of these are antagonisms, a few mutualisms, so, and this is at the start of an experiment. So when we go into the wild, we collect a bit of tree hole water, we isolate some bacteria, and we put them into a tube together, they tend to fight. But this changes as the experiment progresses. This is what it looks like after about 50 bacterial generations. Um, you can see that all of these really strong negative-negative interactions, all the strong fighting has dissipated. And you end up with bacteria that are um, ignoring each other to a greater extent. There are still lots of negative interactions, but those negative interactions are much weakened. We've done experiments where we've progressed this even further and looked, so this is an ex a different experiment where we've looked at how those interactions evolve over more than 100 generations. This is an experiment containing just four species. It's more difficult to do species, uh, experiments for long, that last longer durations. Uh, each of the nodes in this network is a species, so we have four species, A, B, C, and D, and the connections between the species indicate the sorts of interactions that are happening amongst them. The blue lines are negative interactions, so those bacteria are fighting, and the red lines are positive interactions, those bacteria are helping the other. Um, and this is what it looks like at the beginning of the experiment. It's a repeat of what happened in the other experiment. The lines are all Dark, dark blue, um, because they're all fighting with each other. We take the bacteria from the natural environment, we put them in a tube, and they fight. 
Um, but by the end of the experiment, after 100 generations or more, these have not only adjusted their physiology, but they have evolved. And they have evolved in such a way that they're now predominantly either helping each other or ignoring each other. And we've done quite a lot of work trying to figure out uh, what's happening here. Um, and it, we think what's happening is that at the start of the experiment, they're competing for resources. They, um, uh, they're all, let us, if you put a little bit of sugar into the environment, everything likes sugar, and so everyone uses it up. And in that way, they're inhibiting each other. Um, but you have one member that was, that was dominant within that niche and is able to sequester the sugar, and the rest are left at a loose end. And that dominant species is using the sugar, but it's using it wastefully and secreting lots of organic molecules into the, into the growth media, which is then being used up by the other species. And in fact, those other species are adapting to using those particular molecules. So that when you look at the structure of these communities at the end of the experiment, you have a system that's now co-evolved, where you have some species that are actually reliant on the metabolism of another species. So you have resources that are being taken up by one, some of which are being secreted as metabolic byproducts and are being taken up by another. And in that way, you're getting these positive interactions which develop. We think that's what's happening, and it looks like this is an incredibly um, common way for that uh, interactions among bacteria develop within natural environments. Um, so we've done all that work, lots and lots of experiments with these, uh, with these tree hole systems where we've gone in, we've isolated individual species, we've, we've constructed these uh, miniature communities using a dozen or a couple of dozen species, but these are still incredibly simplified systems. They're still much, much simpler than communities that we might sample in natural environments. Um, such as a soil. We go into a soil, there's not 10 or 20 species, there's hundreds or thousands of species. So much of what I've been doing since then is to try to, um, uh, try to increase the complexity of these systems, to try to get to a point where we have an ecosystem, an actual ecosystem with the full complexity of organisms that you would typically find in a real life ecosystem. Um, while keeping them simple enough to understand. And that's the trick of it. Um, so a lot of the experiments we've been doing more recently is to try to construct communities using the actual intact communities sampled from those puddles. So now we just go into the puddles, we collect a little bit of the water, and we put that puddle water into a well so that we have now collected that tree hole. We assemble that from lots of different tree holes from, you know, from across the UK. And, um, we can actually preserve these also. We can freeze these in the freezer and we can take them up when we need them. Again, we can do reproducible experiments using intact communities that we can revive and put into microcosms and use to understand ecosystem processes. These are much more complicated experiments because we don't have the individual isolates. We can't go into them and say, how does this one species interact with this one other species? Um, what we have instead are p images, pictures of what these communities look like, and then we try to make inferences about what's going on in the communities. This is the kind of data we have. So this is a summary of 750 communities which were collected from, from these puddles. Um, uh, this is something called an ordination diagram. If you're not familiar with it, uh, just take me one second to explain, I think. Um, each of, so each of the dots is a, is a community. Uh, each of those community contains thousands of species. Uh, and it's just a visualization technique where communities that are closer together are more similar to each other. So let's take some communities you know. You might have uh, a pine forest and uh, a, uh, a broadleaf forest. There are different kinds of forest, but they're both different kinds of forest. So we might place those communities close together in this space. Whereas if we took a, a lake or a, uh, or a marine habitat, then those would contain completely different sets of creatures and that would be further away in that space. So these two communities are relatively similar, whereas this community down here is relatively different from the one all the way up there. 
The different colors here are, we've, we've classified these communities, we've tried to look for structure in here, and we've tried to identify different community types in the same way that you can walk around and say, oh yeah, this is a conifer forest, this is a broadleaf forest, or here I've walked into a pond and that's clearly a different sort of habitat. We don't have that kind of intuition with bacterial communities, and so we try to recreate it here. So we have light blue communities, we have yellow communities, red communities, and so forth, and we can take the average of those communities and look at what sorts of creature we find in them. So a class one community contains mostly this blue, it's Pseudomonas putida, whereas class two communities contain something different, it's a, a species of serratia, and so forth. And because we've isolated those communities, we have them you know, in, the, in, in the freezer, we can take them out and test them uh, for different ecosystem processes, and that's what we've done here. So we've, t we've tested them against a whole range of different processes. We've looked at their ability to degrade different kinds of organic molecule like chitin and cellulose, and you can see, and the different colors here represent different abilities to degrade uh, those, uh, those different substrates. So blue means that they don't degrade them very well, whereas red means they can degrade them very well. And you can see the different classes. Um, they don't just differ in terms of their composition. They differ in terms of those ecosystem processes. So we've, we've identified different kinds of community, and we've demonstrated that they are also functionally different. They, they contribute differently to the way in which those ecosystems operate. We've done lots of other experiments using these kinds of uh, uh, intact communities. We've done experiments like throwing different sorts of invader into those communities so we can take one of our isolates from the collection and spike it into all 750 communities in this case uh, and look for patterns. So in this case, this, this invader performed much less well when you had more and more of the category four species within that community than if there are fewer of those category four species. So there's something to do with category four which is preventing that invader from getting into the community. Uh, we've also looked at how some of these isolates from our collection are evolving within those different communities. So this was an experiment in which we took some of our isolated bacteria, we put them into little cages, and we suspended the cages into the communities and tracked their evolution over time. We did this for lots of different isolates and for lots of different communities, and the different colors here indicate how rapidly they evolved in those environments. And you can see that for all the isolates, so these are different species of bacteria, Arthrobacter and Bacillus and so forth, and you can see that, we'll take uh, this, uh, this Chrysiobacterium for example, it evolved very rapidly in one of those communities, but not in any of the others. So there's something about that biotic environment, the surrounding species, which is preventing the evolution of that isolate, that one species of bacterium. And we've been trying to figure out what it is about those bio biotic communities, what it is about the species that surround it, that prevent, that constrain evolution. And some of the things that we've been looking at, for example, is uh, how adapted they are to break down some of the substrates. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is the ability of each of these isolates to break down chitin, cellulose, and xylose. Uh, each of these arrows indicates the, um, uh, uh, well, the start of the arrow indicates how well they were able to degrade those substrates at the start of the experiment, and the end of the arrow indicates how well they were able to degrade that substrate at the end of the experiment. And you can see they're all evolving in the same direction in terms of how they're able to degrade those substrates. But some of them are able to evolve and others don't evolve at all. And the ones that are able to evolve are the ones that are already part way along that trajectory. They're already slightly pre-adapted to living in those environments, in those biotic environments surrounded by that community. And that's what releases them from that, from, from that constraint and allows them to evolve to those environments. So lots of experiments, taking these intact communities and trying to figure out what's going on in them. Uh, but who cares about puddles, right? I mean, I think uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of 
taxpayer money, trying to figure out what's going on in these puddles in the woods, and does it all really matter? Should we care about trying to understand what's happening here? And of course, I would argue, of course, it's important. It's vitally important. Um, and uh, I think it's important for one really significant reason. And that is because as we start to unravel this, how this works, it allows us to extrapolate to lots of different areas, lots of different fields, lots of different environments, some of which are actually useful in some ways. So with the small amount of time that remains to me, I wanted to just uh, explain some of the things that were happening in the lab at the moment, uh, or, which, uh, or, or very recently, ways in which we've taken our knowledge of what's happening, happening in puddles to try to understand real, you know, uh, uh, real applied systems. Um, so we've been uh, studying floriculture. We have some, uh, been collaborating with some uh, growers up in Norfolk who grow flowers for the supermarket trade. So this is a flower called scented stock, Matiol in Cana. Uh, and uh, they grow them in, in greenhouses, in glass houses. Uh, but there's an emergent pathogen that's been infecting these flowers, something called Fusarium oxysporum. Uh, Fusarium infects the plants, it causes this yellow discoloration, and in time it kills the plants. Um, the yellow discoloration means that they're not really, uh, can't be sold, and of course, if there's any mortality, then that, that affects the bottom line. So they've been very interested in trying to exclude this pathogen, trying to prevent it from getting into the soils and the greenhouses. Um, so this is actually an invasion experiment. This is very similar to the sort of experiment where we're looking at what properties of communities might exclude an invader, in this case, a pathogenic fungus from the soil. Um, and interestingly, to get rid of uh, this particular pathogen, they don't have any uh, uh, chemicals that they can put on it. Uh, uh, what, they, what they do is they cover the greenhouse with these huge tarpaulins, and then they inject steam under the tarpaulin to sterilize the soil down to a depth of about 30 centimeters. Uh, the fusarium comes back, uh, it always comes back, you don't kill it, um, uh, but that gives them just about enough time to grow their flowers before the fusarium gets to them. But what you're doing here is you're, you have a bit of a, a blank slate for a new community to come in, so there are opportunities there. How do we create a soil community in this context that would prevent the fusarium com from coming back or at least slow down its rate of progress. Uh, something else, we've been using uh, microbes to generate electricity. Uh, so this is, uh, Theo's been leading on this project. Uh, this is a new area for me. Uh, this is something called a microbial fuel cell. Um, fuel cells come in lots of different shapes and sizes. It's actually fairly old technology. Uh, but the general idea is that if you grow bacteria in an anaerobic environment, then as they're growing, they produce carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions and electrons. And if you have the conditions that are right, you can create a bridge from that anaerobic environment that's free of oxygen to an aerobic environment, um, like air or like water that's, that has air bubbling through it. And in that bridge, you have a, a special membrane which only allows protons to get through, only H plus ions to get through. And they'll diffuse across that membrane. And that will leave the electron ion, the electrons all by themselves. And if they're next to a conductive material, then they'll follow the hydrogen ions to the aerobic environment. And that will create a current, um, uh, which can be measured, which can be used to store electricity in a battery, which can be used to, uh, to run an instrument or light up a light bulb. So we've been, and uh, we, you can look at this as uh, you know, not just electricity generation, but electricity generation in this case is our ecosystem process. It's the thing that we're trying to optimize, the thing that we're trying to change as we're changing the communities. So Theo's been doing experiments where he's been changing the diversity of these communities and looking at how the voltage changes over time. In this case, as we uh, create high diversity communities, we seem to be getting more voltage than we do in low diversity communities. And there's the opportunity there to manipulate communities to optimize the amount of electricity that you're getting out. Um, final uh, uh, 
uh, final example is we've been doing a lot of work trying to understand impacts of different sorts of stressors on microbial communities. So we've been um, taking these complicated microbial communities, putting them into our microcosms in the lab, and perturbing them in different ways, antagonizing microbes. Um, so we've been warming them up and cooling them down. We've been adding different sorts of pesticides, antibiotics, whole cocktails of things, creating a bit of an, um, an Armageddon and, and looking how, at how they respond to those different sorts of perturbations so that we can understand how that's happening in natural environments. And along with Guy, we've been extending this not just to these, these little systems, but to much larger systems. So extrapolating that from tiny little puddles uh, to very big puddles, uh, to pools, in fact. So this is the mesocosm, the experimental pond facility at Silwood Park. Uh, these are people walking around. And in each of these miniature ponds, each of these larger ponds, uh, we have uh, subjected them to different kinds of disturbance. And we've been tracking what's happening to these, uh, to these microbial communities, along with collaborators who have been looking at the biogeochemical cycles and at the larger fauna that's found in them. Uh, so we can go from thinking about these small puddles, fairly nebulous experiments that are conducted using very simple systems in the labs, to starting it to understand much more complex systems. So hopefully, at this stage, you love bacteria, you appreciate them, uh, as, as well as little puddles in the woods, and hopefully you'll be taking note of them next time you look through a woodland. Uh, and I finish off by uh, thanking a lot of people. Um, so I wouldn't, wouldn't be here without the help of many, many people. Um, it's very difficult to put down all of them. Uh, I've, I've tried my best. I've probably left out some important people, in which case I sincerely apologize. But it's been quite a long journey. So you know, st starting as an undergraduate, and then ending as a professor. This started in uh, 1996, uh, so that's how long it takes, more or less. Uh, and during that, that time, I've been very lucky to, um, to be funded by a variety of different organizations. Um, started out, uh, it's probably appropriate time to thank my mother and father who, um, uh, who have helped me be beyond just, uh, uh, beyond money, of course. I mean, uh, my father has inspired me in lots of ways. And I think if, if my mom has, hadn't uh, nagged me in school to finish my homework, then I probably wouldn't be here at the moment. Um, during my master's degree and my doctorate degree, I was funded by the Canadian and Quebec government and by the uh, University of Oxford. Um, as Guy mentioned, I was funded, my salary was funded for eight years by the Royal Society, which really gave me a springboard for starting a career as an independent researcher. Uh, and since then, uh, my salary, of course, is paid by Imperial College, but to do any of this science, you actually need to get grants from funding agencies, and the Natural Environment Research Council have been um, very, very generous in providing a series of grants that have supported my research. The European Research Council and the BBSRC have also um, been very helpful, and most recently, the, the Leverhulme Trust have provided us with, with a lot of money to continue on in this route. Um, I've had lots of mentors and uh, supervisors. Um, Don Kramer, Yap Kalf, and Amanda Vincent started me out on this trajectory and very influential in, um, uh, in helping me get set up in this area. Dolph Schluter was my master supervisor, and Diane inspired me to work on tree holes. She actually worked on tree holes in Silwood Park for her doctorate degree on aquatic insects. Uh, Jonathan was my PhD supervisor. Andy is in the audience and taught me everything that I know about microbiology. Um, Owen Lewis took over as my supervisor, and Dick was sort of the glue that held that mini department together. Uh, I'm grateful for Angus and Joy uh, for, um, uh, for helping me during my fellowship, and Paul Harvey, who gave me my first proper academic job. Um, Guy and Tim are here today and really inspired me uh, as I entered into my lectureship. Armand was my line manager, uh, and uh, Murray and Anne were my heads of department who really pushed me forward, uh, pushed my case forward for putting me forward as a professor. 
Um, I'm not going to go over everyone else. There are, these are all the collaborators that I've worked with over the years. Um, many, many important people who have uh, helped me to do my science and have um, inspired me really in the experiments that I've tried out. Um, there are a large number of support staff who have also helped me. Um, whenever we want to do an experiment to keep the labs running, there's a whole set of technicians. If we want to apply for a grant, there are people who run the finances. If we want to hire someone, then there are people in HR who help us. We couldn't really operate without support staff. Um, this is everyone who's passed through my lab. Uh, one of the PhD, my ex-PhD students who uh, said they couldn't come today, but said, I'm, I'm still going to join you online so that I can um, s see how my work made you a professor. And I think that's probably the case. You're, you're only the product of, your science is the product of the, what, your peop what your students and postdocs has produced. And you're only as good as, as your students and postdocs. So I, I really appreciate the work that they've put into this. Um, and finally, Jordana, um, my wife, who has been with me uh, since the beginning, since 1996, um, for, a lot, for lots of years, uh, and Greg and Alex, who have joined more recently, and I think who couldn't quite believe that people would come here to listen to their boring father. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so thank you very much for listening today and for coming. Appreciate it. Thanks very much, Tom, and congratulations. Thank you. Yep. Do, Do you I want sit to... now? <laughs> yes, maybe just stand, stand there for a second. We'll move over to questions, and then we'll have the, the, the vote, right vote of thanks. Yeah, you don't quite get away just, <laughs> just yet. So fantastic talk, and it's been a pleasure working with you all these years, and very well deserved, so e excellent. Um, I'd just like to say as well, Tom has influenced me massively. I, I, I do suffer now from what I could probably call bacterial envy. I always thought as an entomologist I was working with God's own creatures, uh, but I've come to realize, sadly, I probably made a wrong turn earlier in my career, and I should have been doing what Tom's doing. So we're kind of meeting in the middle, and you can see very clearly that some of this amazing work he's doing, he's really pushed the boundaries of our understanding of not just the microbes, but the, the planet within which they're, they're really driving. So I think that, that's an amazing achievement and well-deserved. Anyway, so I'll, I won't go any further than that. I'll hand over to questions now. Maybe we'll take a que any questions from the floor first, and then we'll see if Theo and Tom have things coming in from the chat line. Okay, question. Yes? Oh, hold on. Can you just wait till we've got the microphone down to you? It's just coming your way, just so the, the folks online can also pick it up. Great talk, Tom. Um, so if, when you let bacteria co-evolve in the lab, they evolve to be kind of benign, maybe a little bit kind to each other, then why is it that when you look in nature, they tend to be aggressive towards each other? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, and I don't have the answer to that. But I suspect the reason is because we force them together. So in, in natural environments, uh, you have uh, the 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 partners with which each species in, is in, interacting is constantly changing. And so they don't have that co-evolutionary process that allows them to adapt to each other. Whereas when we constrain them in a microcosm, we're forcing them together. Yep. Have you ever thought about, about using that to then say, oh, well, so if that's true, that the, the, the microbes that are show positive interactions with each other are probably the ones that have a, a longer co-evolutionary history in, or more intense co-evolutionary co interactions in the real world? Yeah, I, th yeah. I think that's probably the case. And, and uh, one, one prediction would be that in, in systems where they are held together in, in that way, you would find more positive interactions, like, you know, like in specialized environments, like in the, in the gut and places like that, whereas, whereas in soils which are, or fresh water where they're much more mixed, um, then, then you would tend to find much more antagonistic interactions. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Okay, do you have any more questions from the floor? Yes, please. Yep. Just wait till the microphone is just coming down to you. Um, are there many overlaps with uh, human microbial communities? I imagine there are, but um, have you had much of a chance to 
examine those? Uh, so I've, I've not done much work with human microbiomes. I've been involved peripherally with one or two papers, uh, but I've tended to stay away from humans. Uh, hu human micro, uh, looking at human microbiomes is a fairly crowded field, and one of the problems is that it's much more difficult to do experiments. Um, so if you wanted to look at actual human microbiomes, then you'd have to do some kind of manipulations with humans, which isn't usually allowed, whereas these sorts of systems are much more tractable. But I think the general conclusions that we draw can, are applicable to human systems. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of the ways in which these interactions are changing and shifting over time, I think, would be applicable to human environments. And, and maybe something that's, that's interesting, for example, as you look at um, you know, colonization of human gut and how those interactions change over the lifetime of a person, I think, I think a lot of that could be applicable to that scenario. So it will be environmental factors or the various things that play on the yeah. human systems. Yes, definitely. So you have similar, in the, in the same way in that last slide as we've been adding cocktails of pollutants and things like that to ponds, you can imagine someone taking an, an antibiotic or changing their diet or something like that, and that, that certainly has a large impact on your, on your gut microbiome. Yep. Okay. Um, are, we, are we doing, how are we doing for time? Are we okay? Can we squeeze a couple more in? Okay. Can we have a couple? Can you put your hand up again? I'm on. So in the history of ecology, uh, community ecology, there's, we can say there's been roughly two grand opposition views. The idea that communities are made up of many species which don't interact terribly strong with each other, and there's the other completely opposite view that the communities are practically super organisms, you know, uh, extremely tightly integrated. My question to you is this. What is the current view in the ecological community, in, among ecologists, what is sort of the consensus view, not just the microbes, and to what degree does your, the unparalleled detail with which you can examine these interactions challenge or confirm that view? Uh, I, th I think what these kinds of exper experiments demonstrate is that it is system specific. I think it's, it's not, uh, uh, that there, sh there shouldn't be an argument that one view is, co is the correct one and the other is not. It's to look at the conditions under which you produce more cohesive s systems, uh, communities, versus the conditions under which you would produce less cohesive uh, communities. Uh, and it's, it's perhaps similar to Craig's question, really, that if you have an ecosystem where the members are forced together over co-evolutionary co time scales, then you'll you will start to build systems where you have more mutual dependencies. Whereas when you have more mixed ecosystems, all of that breaks down and is made afresh, and you get more of these antagonisms which develop. Um, yeah, I think that's, okay. that's... I think we'll take one more question, then we'll move to the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I noticed in uh, the experiment you showed with the triangular coordinates that nearly all the movement was towards um, increasing cellulose, which I suppose is not surprising because that is the primary uh, food source for the environment where you got your bacteria. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting, but a lot of them don't seem to move um, yeah. when you, you change this. Uh, so have you thought about taking away uh, those uh, populations that don't seem to respond uh, to adding cellulose and seeing what that does to the overall the, the system. Because presumably those other things are doing something in the system, um, but not primarily reacting to the cellulose. I, I probably explained that poorly. Um, I'll just put it up so that we make sure. So what this shows is uh, we have these these cages, it's a dialysis membrane um, that we put a focal species inside. So we have one species that we can pull out of that community and we can track how it evolves. So we have one focal species, but then we have diverse communities in there which likely contain some cellulose degraders as well. Um, and so these trajectories, so each one is a, a species, the different colors are the different species. 
Um, and you're, you're, you're right that a lot of them are doing nothing. Um, if we take that out, that's just taking one, spe one sp species out, just the focal species out, and we're not tracking at all what's happening to the rest of the community in this particular experiment. But we think the reason why they're not doing anything is because there's something already in there that's able to do it, and that's preventing it from evolving. Something's already occupying that niche, so other pre-adapted things are, um, are, are constraining its evolution. Unless it's partly along that trajectory already, then it doesn't get started at all. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. I think we'll draw the questions to a close for now, but you can always grab Tom over drinks in the concourse if you want to interrogate him further. Please feel free to do so afterwards, but we'll hand over now to Professor Tim Barraclough, who's kindly joined us. I should say rejoined us. He was previously imperial, but is now at Oxford University for the vote of thanks. Do the slides just move directly on for Tim? Keep going. Keep going. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think it just, it's just on the end. Yeah, yep, there you go. go. Okay. Over to you, Tim. Good. Thanks, Guy. And thanks, Tom, for a fantastic talk. Uh, so my job now is to provide some context and evaluation uh, for what we've just heard. And I'd like you to take you back to the beginning. So our start, story starts a long time ago in some woods far, far away. Uh, Whiteham Woods, to be precise, just north of Oxford in the early 1970s. And at that time, a young couple lived in a fairy tale cottage uh, deep in the woods while the husband worked on his PhD thesis on the ecology of smooth newts. And there they conceived. They conceived a lifelong interest in ecology and evolution that perhaps contributed in part uh, to the excellent science that we've heard in today's lecture. Now the student, uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now the student, Graham, um, finished his thesis, and with Susan, they crossed the ocean to seek fame and fortune in Canada, where they had three sons. And somehow, guided by the same primal life force that drives a salmon back to its natal stream, or a young cuckoo to migrate to Africa and back, the middle son, Tom, was drawn back to the same small patch of woods where our story began. So, armed with great knowledge of the workings of higher plants and animals, and a deep desire to solve the uncharted mysteries of microbial communities, our hero Tom set off on the research path that you heard about today. So, inspired by the humble tree hole as a microcosm for microbial ecology, his PhD work um, delivered the double whammy of a science and nature paper, and two of the neatest straight lines that you've... <laughs> Uh, that have ever been seen in the field of ecology. And we always, already saw one of those. So Tom quickly established a reputation for clarity of thought and experimental design that we've seen, we've heard about today. Lots of people at the time were try, starting to try and describe bacterial diversity, and they still do. Um, but Tom pioneered an experimental approach to discover what's really going on, the mechanisms. So you can't gain true understanding of a system unless you poke it with a stick. So this work led to the departmental lectureship at Oxford while he expanded the tree hole system and built a network of collaborators, and it was at that time that I started working with him. So Whiteham is nice, but we all know there's only one wood where an ambitious young ecologist ecologist can really make his mark. And sure enough, Tom eventually moved to Silwood with a Royal Society University Research Fellowship and Lectureship and quickly flourished there in his new home, bringing in an ERC um, starting grant very quickly to amplify the tree hole work and expand into new areas. He also immersed himself into Silwood life where his uh, strong throwing arm and innocent facial expression 
um, proved to be very handy at the traditional Christmas dinners. And his singing voice left an equally lasting impression on those who heard it at the post-dinner karaoke. So at this time, he was building up a group of, of strong characters who, as he said, helped his work to flourish, and in turn, of course, he, whose careers he helped to flourish. And above all, he described, displayed a really strong commitment to hiring as many other people as called Tom as was humanly possible. <laughs> um, and apologies to the Toms who I've not managed to fit onto this slide. So... These new uh, projects drew on Tom's unique blend of attributes, which include originality, an ability to really simplify these complex systems, and a kind of techie love for finding new ways to tackle a problem. Uh, he's always scouring catalogs for a way to put some kit to an unintended use. Uh, we heard about the tea bags for the um, uh, tree hold experiments there. And soon mere humans, even those called Tom, were not enough to match his grand plans. And after some early aborted attempts uh, <clears throat> to uh, develop robot technicians uh, that can be seen here in the Unit C labs, uh, he finally established the system that we know as Darth Hamilton now that supports much of his work and we saw operating in his talk earlier. And soon... Uh, mere 96 well plates on a small scale were not enough either, and he joined forces with Guy and others uh, to implement aquatic mesocosms on this epic scale. Um, and here you've got Tem, uh, Tom helping uh, set them up by telling other people what to do. <clears throat> and we've seen from his lab coat on the poster... Uh, for this event that Tom is a keen and, and accomplished hands-on researcher. Uh, here he is taking his world-class technical skills into a greenhouse uh, setting. <laughs> okay. Good. So um, around this strong core, Tom became a central figure in the department. We heard from Guy earlier. And as interest in microbes has, has spilled out into ecosystem functioning, microbiomes and beyond, Tom was uniquely placed to uh, support a vast array of, of projects and increasingly strategy and administration for the department as well. He was a leading part of this new generation who really re-established Silwood as a global center for experimental ecology that came out of what was called the Grand Challenges Initiative and now has been renamed uh, the Georgina Mace Center. And this has led, as we've heard, the Leverhulme Center for Holobiont that he's going to lead. So this is generating an avalanche of data. <clears throat> and while not perhaps quite matching the clarity of his earlier figures um, on those papers from his PhD, these are still shining light on uh, microbial ecology and evolution. So I'm nearly finished, but as one final historical aside, um, this is all the more remarkable because for nearly 20 years, and there's a few people in the room who will remember, remember this, the department tried in vain to recruit a microbial ecologist as a strategic priority. And in the end, one of the world's best chose to come here of his own accord and make it his home. So, to finish, success is down to many things, whether it's uh, choosing a growing research field at the right time, or it's the Epigenetic changes that are caused by sunlight glinting from a tree hole back in Whiteham in the 1970s. Uh, if there's one thing I would have bet on, though, in my career, it is that Tom would thrive in his. And it's a delight and honor to be here with all of you celebrating uh, his achievements today. Congratulations, Tom, and many thanks for your lecture.